it's one half CV squared, isn't it? Or am I remembering that wrong? You are remembering that correctly. Magically, any system that has energy storage always looks like that. Okay, you should have seen that before. So let's, let's think about this. Here's a car. What's the, so, it, so it, before I move to the car, in the capacitor, what's the thing that's storing energy here? The electric field. Yeah, the electric field inside the capacitor. It's the, 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 the capacitor is the thing that represents the energy storage, right? So the electric field inside there, right? And so what about in the case of the car? There's energy storage there as well. What would that energy storage be? Are you referring to the kinetic energy? Uh, whatever the energy is that you think it is. Let me put it that way. Battery? Well, all right, so, okay, let me, yeah, let me be clearer then. All right, so if, I, the car, if the car is moving like this, I'm referring to the kinetic energy. Yeah, so one half mv squared. One half mv squared. Now that looks- Different awfully, v's. <laughs> that looks a lot like one half cv squared, all right? And in this case, I'm gonna say this guy is moving at some speed v, okay? Now, anytime you got energy storage in a system, uh, the laws of energy conservation are at play, all right? And what do we know about the laws of energy conservation? What's the first law of energy conservation? Energy and matter cannot be created or destroyed. Right, and, and effectively what that means in the context of any of these systems is that energy needs to be continuous, okay? Energy needs to be continuous. Now let's think about that for a second. You ever taken a uh, let's say you take a, a hairdryer or a toaster and you pull it, you pull the cord out of the wall without turning the thing off. What do you notice when you pull the cord out of the wall? Sometimes I see a little arc as or flash as I'm pulling it out. Arc. You'll see a flash of light as you do that because there was an energy, one half Li squared, then you made the I go to zero instantaneously and nature said, you can't do that. I have energy, I need to let it go somewhere. And so it goes from electrical charges moving to basically all of a sudden into light, okay? That's the basic idea of, 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 of how this kind of comes into play. Now, I, wanna, I just wanna think about these two systems. There's stored energy in both of these cases. So let's, let's say if I looked at the capacitor here, all right? If I look at the capacitor and I had this particular circuit, you guys should know in this case, if I've drawn the circuit like I have there on the left, what's happening to the voltage on the capacitor? It's going to go up. Sure can't go up. Yeah, no, it would decrease over time. It would have to decrease over time. The resistor eats it away. That's well, because, yeah, I got no sources, right? There's no source of energy here. So energy is going to have to go away in this particular case. All right. And so the thing about this particular system is I can say here, so the, the you guys should know the rate of change of the voltage on the capacitor, the rate of change of the voltage is, first of all, the rate of change of voltage is dvc dt, right? The capacitor current is that, okay? If, if I said, okay, the interesting thing about this particular circuit is the rate of change of that voltage is equal to, or directly related to the voltage on the capacitor itself. You guys follow that, All right? The, so what, what this equation says <clears throat> in words, I just said it. I wanna, I wanna see if you guys caught what I said. What does that equation say in words? Because it has a meaning, a physical meaning. What is it? It says that the voltage is proportional to how fast the voltage is changing. The voltage is proportional to how fast the voltage is changing, okay? So that means if the voltage is, when, when does the rate of change of voltage happen faster? When the voltage is high or when the voltage is low? When the voltage high. is high. When the voltage is high, okay? When the voltage is high. So let's say, let's look at V of T here. V sub C. Let's say it started out at, you know, 10 volts, okay? Now, you know that in this system, there's no source of energy, so it better eventually go to zero, okay? And for whatever reason, we've always said, well, somehow it must magically equal the exponential function. And the exponential function is actually pretty natural. And you can think about why it's natural, because if you think about what, what's going on in this particular system, the rate of change here has to be highest initially. 
And the rate of change is basically dropping because as the voltage drops, the rate is dropping, okay? So V sub C, when it's 10 volts, the rate of change is gonna be higher than when it's down here at one volt, okay? That kind of behavior gives rise to a voltage that is going to be of some exponential form. And tau is how fast that guy drops. Okay, and that's pretty, that's, that's actually provable, right? Anything that changes continuously and the rate of change depends on itself always gives rise to an exponential fall, all right? That is why we call it the natural logarithm. It's natural in any case. So, I mean, so let me, so again, we're gonna try to be general here. So I had a car moving here at a, at, with a mass M and a velocity V, all right? So how, how could I get the same equation here? How could I get that same equation in this case? This is a physics question. Where would I start to get that same equation? At least an equation of the same form. Probably have to write the velocity as a differential. Okay, I gotta write the velocity as a differential. So what, whose, whose laws would I begin with to do that? Newton. Newton, all right, so we got three choices here. Which one are we gonna take a choice on? Who's going to relate? How, how, how can we relate the velocity to what's going on here with Newton's law? Which, which one? Uh, would it be Newton's second law? F equals MA, yes. So I got second law from Nathan, and in the room I got F equals MA. So basically, F equals MA is the net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Now that looks a lot like that, okay? So they look pretty similar. So in this case, I don't know, let's say this guy is just slowing down. So net force means I got some force that would like an engine that would make me go forward. And let's say I turn the engine off. I let, I let go of the brake or I let go of the gas and this guy's just gonna naturally slow down. If I let go of the gas, am I just gonna stop right away? No. No, because I've got energy stored in this thing and there is some opposition to me. And that opposition would be in the form of friction, right? Now, this may be a tricky question, but if you think about friction, friction generally is of the form some constant, I'm gonna call it beta times the velocity, right? The faster you're going, the more friction there is. Try that in your car, right? Um, you can see that it requires more energy once you're going faster than it does when you're going slower, okay? That looks like exactly the same relationship. And if I looked at the speed of my car, it would also be an exponential. This exponential behavior is, is always there anytime we have energy storage. And what Does gravity it, not affect it? Um, you know, I'm, I'm approximating a little bit here, but gravity is really not going to have an effect if I'm only really moving forward, right? If you were talking about upward motion, right, then that would be part mm -hmm. of it, right? But if I'm just talking about lateral motion, then it's, it's just that. And I'm, I, so I'm assuming a perfectly flat surface when I do that. Gotcha. That and the force of gravity would be equal. The yeah, force of gravity would come into play if I was going uphill or something like that, right? But just, just, you know, in this case, let's assume I'm on flat ground, all right? So if, if you think about what's happening here, it's the same sort of thing. Like initially the rate of decay of my speed is gonna be high when I'm going, you know, 60 miles an hour, as opposed to by the time I'm at 10 miles per hour, right? So in all of these cases, I get an exponential fall. And what that exponential fall ultimately represents is, is the energy storage transition part, okay? So essentially what this says is any system with energy storage, which I call a dynamic system, where there is some time dependence in what the variables have. Like you never talked about, in circuits one, you never talked about anything being of T, right? You never said voltage is a function of time until you got the differential equations, right? until I got to energy storage. When you had just pure resistor circuits, nothing was ever a function of time because it didn't matter, okay? Once I have energy storage, so in the case of electrical stuff, Rs and Ls, then I have energy storage, then I have dynamics, then I have time dependence, okay? So anytime I have these systems, there's two parts of my response. One that's derived directly from the input to the system, okay? And one that reflects this finite amount of time that it takes for the energy to change from its initial state to its final state, okay? So in the example of this capacitor, if that capacitor was charged to 10 volts, do I have both of those responses here or just one? One. Just one of them, right? 
basically what I get is this natural decay. Just what it's doing is it's representing the, the fact that the energy stored in that capacitor takes time to leave. All right? And it takes time to leave because the rate of change is related to how much is there. Okay. And that's a really, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're doing mechanical systems, civil engineering systems, electrical engineering, so whatever you're doing, this, this phenomenon is always there. And, and ultimately it's important. It's the only thing that's really interesting. And for the most part, the circuits that you guys looked at in circuits one are kind of dumb, right? For the, there's usually more than just resistors. I usually also have to have energy storage, which means I have to have differential equations. And, the, and, and there's always going to be two responses. And that's the thing I think I want you guys to, to take away from this more than anything is there's always going to be two responses. One, which I'm going to, which you, you, in math, you call the particular response, particular solution, which I think of as the driven solution. Engineers kind of call it that way. This is sometimes I call the driven solution because it results from some source. The fact that I have an energy source forces there to be an output. Okay. And then I have this response that reflects, and this is important, the finite amount of time it takes to get from some initial state to some final state. And there, that always exists because the system, what this says is the energy stored in that capacitor can never change in zero time. Think about that for a second. For the energy to change in zero time would require the current to be infinite. And that's not possible. Okay. All right, so I don't, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spend too much time on that because I think we'll get too mathy too fast. Okay, and I, even though this is kind of a math class, I don't want to get too mathy on you. All right, although I'm probably about to anyway. All right, this is a key concept and we're gonna play with this a little bit more because I, I think it's important to understand it. All right. Now, <clears throat> this is where, if not already, the computer engineers start to get irritated because like, oh, differential equations again, it seems very electrical. And it does, but, but I, wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about computer hardware here because this stuff matters even in computer hardware. So first of all, what I've drawn here as, as a quiz for everybody, what are those things that I have drawn? Not gates. I, Not gates or inverters, yeah, right? So that means if I put a one here, what do I get at the output? Zero. 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 Put a zero, I get a one, all right? Very uninteresting circuit. All right, now, this circuit, as I'll talk about for the project, consists of basically two transistors. It's called a CMOS stage. You might have heard that term before, okay? But in, in this case, I wanna, I wanna think about this. So hopefully from 2181, maybe you have a little bit of a sense. Um, if I have a one, what does that mean physically? How do I get a one in any real system? A oh, high voltage, all right? So let's say I had, what I call a clock waveform over here of some sort. What's a clock waveform mean? It's, uh, it's just a, it's a wave that repeats consistently. A wave that repeats. That's sometimes what we call a square wave. Let's say I got this wave that's repeating like this, okay, over here. And he's going, here's a one, here's a zero, here's a one, here's a zero. And let's say in this case, it was five volts every time I have a one, okay? What would I, what do I think this output is going to look like over here? So zero, uh, in the middle there, it's gonna just invert all those spots. So it'll be zero, one, zero, one. Yeah, it should look like that, right? So he's gonna be, when I have a one here, a zero here, zero here, one here, one here, zero here, okay? Should look like that in theory, right? We sort of agree that's probably what it should look like. You look at a real system like this, it will, this is what we, so here's V in, here's V out. This is ideal. This is real. Right there, All right? In other words, what this kind of, what does this look like here? A little bit exponential. A little bit of an exponential. Now that basically, what does that kind of mean? That means that my output's kind of slow, or it's not, it's not necessarily that slow, but it's kind of slow. It's slower than I wanted it to be. This was my ideal case. But what I'm saying is I know it's gonna be a little bit rounded, all right? Now, what I did here is I kind of postulated a little bit on why that might be, right? So for instance, it might be the case that now what's going on is to, let's say this, let's say this output here goes from zero to five volts real, all of a sudden, okay? 
Well, what's going on is there's going to be a current that flows through that wire. There's a magnetic field that comes from that, right? And there's going to be charges moving around in this system, right? And if you think about what's going to happen, it, ultimately there's going to be some charges moving around. And that means there's going to be an electric field basically from this wire to the return wire on the bottom, right? Current always has to flow in a loop, right? So what's actually happening in the system is currents leaving this guy and going around in a loop like that. All right. So that's what currents do in here. All right. As it does that, there's going to be some charges kind of building up on the top and some negative charges on the bottom. If I have charges like that, what do I have? What kind of device do I have? Capacitor. Got a capacitor, right? And, and so I can effectively make this kind of a model. Anytime I've got a real system, there's probably some capacitance that exists between those wires. And because I said I got a magnetic field, there's also going to be some inductance. And so a more realistic model for the connection between those two inverters is an LRC circuit. Okay? Now what that's going to do is it's going to say, well, maybe I have an input that looks like this. But that makes the voltage at this next gate look like that. All right, now that's going to have a, an effect then on how this gate over here behaves. All right, so we're going we're gonna to think about how to model that a little bit in the, in the project. All right, and we're going we're gonna to do it in, in numerically all right, in the project. We kind of think about how to control that sort of thing a little bit. All right, but I, I wanted to, you know, when, I, when it comes to computer hardware, this still matters, right? And that's kind of an important idea. Um, in computer hardware, this, this stuff is still present, okay? Now, there's a lot going on there, so I don't fully expect you guys to have a complete appreciation of all the details of this, right? But, but I mean, I think fundamentally, you should be able to understand that anytime I got charges moving here, there's, there's going to be positive charges and negative charges in the system. And so there's going to be some level of capacitance and there's magnetic fields. So there's going to be some level of energy storage from that, which means there's going to be some inductance. All right. We're going to, we're going to look at that example more in the project, but, but basically these things come up all the time in ways you hadn't thought about. And, and the problem is because there's energy storage, what it means, and this is the key thing, right? There's a response that reflects the finite amount of time it takes for the energy to change from its initial state to its final state. And that's why this guy looks slower than we thought it would have been. All right, so you start talking about digital logic, they talk about delay times, like it takes, you know, three nanoseconds or 10 nanoseconds for the output to change. Well, that's why, right? Because, because charges are moving in that system and you are making energy change, all right? And so that stuff tends to matter. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a design context for computer problems. All right. So what I want to do is, is I want to look at this circuit and I want to, today, I said at the beginning, what I wanted to do is I wanted to introduce ourselves to a key concept in first order circuits, okay? Um, and I, I, I want to talk about even what order means, right? What, and, and that concept a little bit. So let's say I had this circuit here um, and I wanted to figure out the differential equation for this particular case, okay? Now, how would I do that? How would I get the differential equation in this case? KVL. KVL, all right. And the way I would do it is I would say, I got IC moving this way. And I always do my KVLs going around uh, counterclockwise. So I'm gonna say zero equals negative V in. So I went minus the plus. And then I'm gonna say I go plus the minus on the R. So what would I write for the, for the R? Yeah. Yep. I C times R plus what about for the capacitor? V sub C. Yep. yep. So V in equals I C R plus V C. But in differential equations, we don't like having two variables, right? How can I, how can I turn this into one equation in terms of V sub C? What can I do? Yeah, I was crying somewhere right now. He might very well be. Wouldn't VC be uh, CLI over DD? C, C, okay, so IC always equals what? CDV DT. 
right? Like that. So R, C, D, V, C, D, T plus V sub C, okay? That now <clears throat> is my differential equation. And I'm gonna look at that for a second, that particular equation. And hopefully you guys know enough on this. And we're gonna look at the process here as we go through today, but there's basically gonna be two answers to that differential equation, right? I know you guys have talked about this a little bit with Yahoo, all right? And you should have seen this in differential equations. All right, what uh, V sub C in this particular case has two parts to its solution. What are the two parts to the solution? One of oh them- Oh my like, God, Bianca. What? Is uh, this Nate, big spider Nate, up? Nate, you're not muted. Might want oh, to mute sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. There's a okay. There's a steady state part. All right. There's a steady state part, steady state part, and a transient. Okay. There's a steady state part and a transient part. What's always in that transient? What's the transient always have to look like? Always. Nope. What's it have to look like? Always. Somebody knows. A, E, T, so let's say T over tau, right like that. In other words, I always have a single exponential, okay? And in steady state, let me ask you, what's, what kind of, what kind of, what's the form of my solution in steady state? In other words, so, the, so in steady state, what's that guy going to look like? What's the voltage on the capacitor going to look like if I wait long enough? Constant. Okay. As long as the input source is constant, at least. Right? But maybe it's not. Okay. If my input source is constant, my steady state is going to be constant, and my transient is going to be exponential. Right? <clears throat> so basically, you get, you get, when you go through the solution process, you get basically a solution that looks like this. Right? I get some solution always that includes, that is basically the final value, the steady state solution, okay, always. And then I get a transient solution. And I try, again, we talked about this a little bit, but what is the meaning of it? Is that over time, there is going to be this vanishing difference between the initial value and the final value. And why is, why does that, there was initially at time t equal to zero, there is a big difference between the final value of the voltage on the capacitor and the initial value of the voltage on the capacitor, right? If this was five volts and the capacitor was initially charged to zero volts, initially there's a five volt difference between those two things. Because the capacitor is an energy storage element, he's basically resisting that change, right? And, he's, and, and there's a vanishing difference between the final value and the initial value. And this guy represents that, that sort of opposition to change, right? It, and and that's, that's what we talked about. There's always two components to my solution. This response that reflects a finite amount of time it takes for energy to change from its initial state to its final state. And then there is this steady state solution that reflects the impact of the input, okay? All right, some basic concepts. Now, in general, when we approach these problems, there's a three-step process, and this method always applies, all right? <clears throat> so basically, you know, in, in the book, if you look in section 7.3, it's set up, I think, so that it, look, it, it has 7.31 is the, is the first part. 7.32 is the second part, right? So again, I'm using math terms here, right? So solve the homogeneous equation, all right? In other words, this guy, this means find my transient solution, all right? I like the term transient. That's more of an engineering term to me. All right, I want to find the part that goes away. This is the part that always goes away. Okay, and we'll talk about that a little bit more next week. But the, the transient solution always goes away. Yahoo hasn't gotten there yet, probably in 2112, but he's going to get there pretty quickly, which is to say, you're going to totally forget about the transient solution eventually because it's gone. If I think about the power system, right? The power system has been on for since whenever the last time a blackout was. It's in steady state pretty much, okay? So I don't need to spend most of my time thinking about transients. I need to spend a lot more of my time thinking about steady state or what we call the non-homogeneous equation in math terms. 
All right, so this is my steady state solution or particular solution. In other words, what happens after the transient doesn't matter, okay? And I followed the terms that the book used. They call this Y sub C, all right, for the, for the homogeneous or what they call complementary solution. There's a lot of terms you can use here, all right? And the particular solution or steady state solution is YP, okay? And the total solution is the sum of those two things. All right, and we can, I can talk about things that they can talk about in math, about uniqueness and existence and why, why this uh, makes sense, but I wanna talk about it from a more physical approach, okay? I think physically you guys can understand the fact that this transient here represents the fact that this thing stores energy and that energy cannot change in zero time. It takes a little while for that energy to change from its initial value to its final value, all right? So in general, we get an equation that looks ugly, all right? In general, I get what I call a differential equation with constant coefficients, meaning these guys here, all right, um, are my, are my um, coefficients, all right? So use terms, I'm not gonna get too worried about those terms here, non-homogeneous and homogeneous. Non-homogeneous means that it's equal to something. Homogeneous means that it's equal to zero. All right, that's basically what it comes down to. All right, now, a couple of things with this. So this guy always has a transient solution. He always has a steady state solution. What does the transient solution always have in it? And we said for any kind of physical system that I might represent right here, so I had the circuit and I had the car. What does my transient solution always have? Always. What kind of function? Exponential. Exponential, okay always exponentials in my transient response, okay? So <clears throat> if I have a circuit that I wanted to do it this way, right? So key ideas, all right? There are as many derivatives in the equation as there are energy storage elements, okay? So if I have an RC circuit, there will be one derivative. If I have an LR circuit, there will be one derivative. If I have an LRC circuit, there's gonna be two derivatives. Okay, that's always gonna be the case. So if I had a circuit with, now, so wait, I, just to be clear here, right? LRC is three things. Why don't I have three derivatives? Because it's only a second order. Well, why is it only second order? Because there's two storage, there's two storage, there's two storage elements. elements. There's two storage elements. Yeah, the R is an energy using element, right? The L and the C are storing elements. So, so I have as many energy storing elements as I have gives me how many derivatives, right? and thus the order, right? So two derivatives means second order, okay? Here's the other thing is then, there's always as many exponentials in the solution as there are derivatives, right? So if there's an RC circuit, one exponential. LR circuit, one exponential. LRC circuit, two exponentials. Now, you guys have seen some RC circuits where you had transient solutions that had cosines. What's a cosine? It's the ratio of the adjacent side of a triangle to the hypotenuse of that triangle. All right, let's broaden our, let's, let's think about what we've learned so far up to this point in the semester. What is it? It's a real part of an exponential. It's also. Two exponentials. There's always two exponentials. Okay. Always. All right, so we're gonna, we're, gonna keep, we're gonna keep going with this, with this idea. We're gonna see how, and we're gonna look at an example here today where we can see how useful the complex stuff becomes. All right, all right, so we got, we got a lot of stuff we gotta do. So on page 360 of the book, um, they talk about the three inputs that, that I'm gonna consider. Um, and I, I wanna be maybe a little bit broader than, than it's been here. So they, they talk about basically a constant input an exponential input, and I'm gonna say more generally than this guy, I'm gonna say a sinusoidal input, right? I might give you a sine, sinusoidal input, okay? 
Now, this function u of t, hopefully you guys have seen that before, but I wanted to define that here real quick. All right, what is u of t? Anybody know what that's called? I'll talk about that more on, on Tuesday. It's called the unit step. It's a function, we'll talk about more on Tuesday. It's a function that's one for t greater than zero and zero for t less than or equal to zero, okay? So <clears throat> it's something that it basically what it represents in circuit form is like I closed a switch at t equal to zero. This is a mathematical representation of that. All right, we'll talk more about that on Tuesday. Let's, I, what I'm gonna, what I wanna do today is I wanna just say, let's, let's say we had a cosine input to a circuit. So let's say I got this circuit and I'm gonna get rid of the u of t for now. Um, I can't get rid of the U of T. Keep. Let me see. Let me do that. Doesn't really change things much if I if I do this. Oh crap! And I did this again. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> let's say I, I apply this at t equal to zero. All right, so I didn't, I didn't apply it before t equal to zero, okay? And I know, so I, and I tried to do this a little bit generally. I'm gonna call this guy x of t, right? I know we don't usually call voltages x, but I'm gonna call it x. All right, I'm gonna call the voltage on this capacitor y. All right, so without a whole lot of fanfare, you should, we, we wrote previously that Vn of t equals rc dv c dt plus v sub c. All right, so I'm gonna replace this. I'm gonna say in this case, that means x of t is my v in, and the capacitor voltage is y, and I'm gonna write it like this, uh, a dy dt plus y, okay? All right, so I got that equation, okay? All right, and this is my x of t, this guy, a cosine omega t. Okay, AC circuit, all right? So I put an AC waveform in this. Now I wanna use that three step process to try to find the solution, okay? All right, so the first step, solve the homogeneous equation. How do I do that? How do I solve to get the transient response? How do I do step one for, set. yeah, go ahead. Set it equal to zero. Set it equal to zero, all right? Set it equal to zero, so in other words, what I do is I do this guy, all right? So sometimes I call this the unforced. In other words, there's no, there's nothing in the system making this guy do anything. I take the original equation. This is my, what I call my non-homogeneous. And don't worry about those terms. Those terms and words freak you guys out. Don't worry about it. It's just in a differential equation, all right? And now I've said, I'm gonna set that guy equal to zero. That will give me the transient response. Right, this, if you think about what's going on, I took the sources out. And so my answer to this guy is gonna be whatever I should get if I didn't have any sources in the system, but I had some energy storage, okay? And I wrote it as Y sub C because Y sub C, I said, if you go back to what I defined here, Y sub C is, my, is what I call my homogeneous equation and I add it to my particular to get the total, okay? All right, so Y sub C. Now, how do I solve this problem? How do I figure out what Y sub C is? How do I figure it out? You do what? Well, so I, I, could, I, could, I could do some integration stuff. I, I could move the AYC over to the other side and I could do an integration of both sides. That, that's, that only works for first order, right? So that would work, it's totally fine, right? But I wanna look at it a little bit more generally, right? If I had a second order system, I wouldn't be able to do that, okay? If I have a first order system like this, what could I do? What's another way to get the answer? I could guess Y sub C, couldn't I? What's a guess? We already know what a guess is, don't we? A E to the... Uh... Uh, the t uh, times constant. 
Yeah, A E to the, and I'm going to be more general. I'm going to say A E to the S T. Where I got to be careful with this, right? Um, I got to make sure that I don't choose A equal to zero because if I chose A equal to zero, then I basically guessed zero, and that's that's a dumb guess. All right, so I I, I do have to give that caveat. So all right, so I guessed this. And it's a good guess because, you know, I've done a lot of things. I've seen a lot of circuits. I know that I get exponentials, right? So it's a good guess. So I plug that in there. So basically I say, well, D by DT of A E to the S T. And let's be clear. S is some constant. S is a constant. Don't know what it is, but it's always a constant. Plus A Y sub C. So that would be little a, big A, e to the st equals zero. All right, now, what happens when I take the derivative of the first term here? What do I get? E to the st. I get s, a, e to the st, plus little a, big A, e to the st. And what do I notice about that right off the bat? So what do I, I, I notice there's some groupings I can do there, right? How can I factor that? Uh, e to the st. Yes, yeah, so it looks like a e to the st is in both terms. So then I'm left with s plus a as a third term. So right there, I got three things that are multiplying to equal to zero. Okay, but what do I know? A can't be zero. So A is not forcing this product to be zero. What about E to the ST? Is E to the ST ever zero? No. No, for no finite T is that ever zero. So what has to be zero? S plus A has to be zero. And so S equals minus A. And my solution to that equation is A E to the negative little A T, okay? All right, so I get that, I get that solution right there. And, and I get it from that guess. And I could have um, 18th order differential equation and I'd follow the same process. If I had an 18th order differential equation, how many exponentials would I get? 18, right? I'd get 18 exponentials out of it, right? <clears throat> and it would be a nasty little equation in here. I'd have, I'd have S to the 18th and a bunch of crap. But, but, it, so, but it, I would have 18 exponentials, okay? Now, that's step one. Step two was to get the, tr the transient or, the, or the, sorry, the particular or the steady state or what I call the forced response, okay? All right, so I go back to this guy. This, is what I, this was the original equation I had, dy dt plus ay plus a cosine function. All right, so we need to guess a solution. So I'm, I'm gonna tell you right now, here's what I'm gonna guess. B times cosine omega t plus phi. And the two things I don't know here, I don't know B. B is unknown. Surely it's not zero though, okay. Is unknown and phi is unknown. I don't know, I'm guessing that my, if I have a cosine coming in, that I'm gonna have a cosine coming out with the same frequency, but I don't know its magnitude and I don't know its phase, okay? All right, that's, what, that's what I'm gonna guess is my solution, okay? So I guess that is my solution. So what that means is you take this guy and you plug it in here and you plug it in here, all right? So when I take the derivative of B cosine omega T plus phi, so if I take the derivative of this expression, right? So derivative of B cosine omega T plus phi, what's that derivative? What's dy P by DT? What would that be? I think that's negative B omega. Negative B omega. Out front and then sine of omega T plus phi. Omega T plus phi. Uh, derivative of cosine is minus sine. Yeah. 
So, so then, so what do I do? So what I did was I plugged that into this. So I plugged this result into this expression. And then I plugged in my B cosine omega T plus phi into this term. And I get this. And that guy is pretty ugly, right? I think it's pretty ugly. Um, you guys probably, you guys think all of this is ugly. So you definitely agree that that's ugly, right? Only way, so the thing I, thing I, problem I got here is I don't know what B is. I don't know what phi is, and I have to solve for them, okay? So what I need now is I need trig identity. So in other words, that looks like what I have here is, so I wrote out trig identity sine alpha plus beta. So it looks like in this case, I got sine omega t plus phi. So this guy would be my alpha. This guy would be my beta. And then I got these trig identities. You can Google those all day long, okay? We have to use trig identity. You have no choice but to use trig identities if I do okay. it this way. Now we're gonna get rid of the trig identities pretty fast, right? Because there's other ways of doing this, all right? Ex complex exponential is gonna make this a lot easier. But I take those trig identities and I say, okay, well, sine omega t plus phi can become this. Cosine omega t plus phi can become that. Now I'm not gonna go through the, the details of it, right? It's, it's boring, you can see it if you, if you go through it. But basically what I do, I do is I gotta take the terms up here and I got to break those down with trig identities. So the sine omega t plus phi becomes this, and the cosine omega t plus phi becomes this. Put them all together, all right? And what I get is this result once I do that substitution. Now that arguably is one of the uglier things you've probably ever seen, okay? Now, what I, what I basically do is I, I look at this and I say, well, there's on the left side of this equation, there's a sine omega t term, and another sine omega t term. And on this side of the equation, there is a plus zero sine omega t, like that, okay? So what I can say is all of the coefficients on the sine omega t terms have to sum to zero. You guys follow that? Because there is no sine omega t term over here. So I grouped them. I got a negative omega B times cosine phi. That's here. And I have a minus AB times sine of phi from this term right there. Has to equal zero. Okay. I'm not, I'm trying to go through this pretty quickly because it's, it's not that useful. All right. It's important, but it's not all that useful. All right. <clears throat> There's a simpler way to do it. The other thing here is I see I got cosine terms, right? I have the cosine term here has to equal A and I pull all the coefficients off. So I got a, I got a minus omega B sine phi, that's here. And I have an AB cosine phi, that's here. Now I have two equations and two unknowns, right? I don't know B and I don't know phi. Two equations and two unknowns, that's a solvable system. It's a, it's a nonlinear system because it depends on its ugly looking system, right? But it, it's a solvable system at this point, right? So <clears throat> what I do at this point is I, I look at this guy and I can say, well, all right, um, these are the same two equations. And what I did is I can take this guy here and I, I rearranged it a little bit, right? And I said, well, I have that minus omega B cosine phi equals A B sine of phi. And if I take cosine or if I take sine over cosine, what is sine over cosine? Tangent. So tangent of phi equals minus omega over A because those guys cancel. And now I just solve for phi. Phi is equal to minus inverse tangent of omega over A, like that, okay? And then I can go through this triangle thing and I can get another expression here for this guy, all right? And I don't wanna spend too much time on it because it's not that useful again. And basically at the end of the day, when everything's done, I end up getting that Y sub P looks like that. I use the triangle to do it, okay? 
I'll post in the final solution all my steps through here, right? But I, I, it's not that useful to me. I get this really ugly, nasty looking thing. And what I found is the amplitude of this solution and the phase shift of this solution. That was ugly. I don't like it, okay? It's a lot of trig, trig identities, all that kind of stuff. What if I went back to the beginning and I said, wait a minute, I guessed that my solution was B times cosine omega T plus phi. Could I guess something similar, but wasn't B cosine omega T plus phi? What could I guess instead? One over two, B two B omega T. What was that? Euler's identity. Euler's identity, yeah. Let's, let's guess instead, we'll come back to this. Let's guess instead that <clears throat> y sub p is equal to, uh, let me be, the real part of b e to the j phi e to the j omega t, like that. That's the same thing as guessing b cosine omega t plus phi. You guys follow that? Hopefully by now, right? I've got this, I've got my whole dynamic phaser thing going on here. You can about to ask something? Okay. Can tough. <clears throat> oh, well, 210 I think is what it's All right, so, so when, I, when I look at this expression here, all right, B cosine omega t plus phi, all right, <clears throat> how about if I use this instead? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug into this system over here. I'm gonna plug into this system B e to the j phi e to the j omega t. So I have A e to the j omega t, okay? So again, originally, if you think about what I had, right? Originally, my system was cosine omega t times A equal to dy p phi dt plus y p times a. That's what I started with. Instead, what I'm gonna say is, I have the real part of a e to the j omega t as my input, okay? And I'm gonna guess <clears throat> that I have the real part of b e to the j phi e to the j omega t as my steady state solution. Now, <clears throat> since I got real parts on both sides, I'm gonna say, how about we just do this? How about I say I have e to the j omega t equal to d by dt of b e to the j phi e to the j omega t plus a times b e to the j phi e to the j omega t, like that. Now, Let's take this derivative to simplify this. What's the derivative of this term with respect to time? J omega, J omega. Give the Greeks their credit. J omega B e to the J phi e to the J omega t. That's that term. Plus A B e to the J phi e to the j omega t, like that. Now, what do I notice about this term, this term, and this term? What do they all have? Well, they all have e to the j omega t. All time dependence just left that expression, okay? And it makes it a heck of a lot simpler. What I have now is that a equals j omega times b in fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna simplify it down. I say j omega plus little a times b e to the j phi, like that. All right, that just got a lot simpler. J omega, j omega. So there's an e to the j omega t over on this side, right? Okay, so basically what I got is a equals j omega plus a, B, E to the J, Phi. Now the two things I don't know, I'm losing you guys at this point. The two things I don't know are B and Phi, okay? So let's say I wanted to figure out what B is, okay? How could I figure out what B is? 
I've just got complex numbers all around here. So how about I take the magnitude of both sides of this expression? Okay. If I take the magnitude of both sides of this expression, the magnitude of A equals the magnitude of J omega plus A. So what's the magnitude of J omega plus A? What's that? Uh, square root of A squared plus omega squared. Yep. So I basically have three magnitudes like that. So this guy becomes omega squared plus A squared. B hopefully was just a constant to begin with, right? Because I chose, just chose it to be some real number, okay? What's the magnitude of E to the J phi? What's the magnitude of e to the j phi? It's just uh, one. one. Yep. And then you could, you could go through cosine squared plus sine squared is one, right? So this guy is b equals a over square root of omega squared plus a squared. Okay. So I very quickly have figured out what that term is. Now, the thing I still need to figure out is what phi is, right? So I have a equals b times j omega plus a times e to the j phi. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, take the angle of both sides. So the angle of a equals the angle of b plus the angle of j omega plus a plus the angle of e to the j phi. Now we can go through that pretty fast. A and B were ideally, they were just real numbers for me, right? So essentially what I, what I should have is that the angle of A, if it's a real number is zero, the angle of this guy is zero. I guess it could be minus one, but let's say it's zero. Let's say it's a positive. I, I mean, I typically I'm gonna choose an amplitude um, to, to be a, just a number, okay? So what's the angle of J omega plus A? Inverse tan of omega over A. What's the angle of E to the J phi? Phi. Okay, so phi equals minus inverse tan of omega over A, like that. So what I found here is that if I put all that together, I found that YP is the real part of B e to the j phi e to the j omega t or the real part of a over omega squared plus a squared e to the j negative tan omega over a e to the j omega t. If I take the real part of that thing, I'm gonna get a over square root omega squared plus a squared cosine omega t minus inverse tan of omega over a. All right. <clears throat> now I'm going to give a detailed worked example in video. All right. Of a, with specific numbers and stuff for you guys to go through. All right. And I'm going to post this recording. Right. But in, in, in what you, what you're going to see here is, you know, we went through that fast, but if we use the complex numbers and we use Euler, we actually got to an answer in a far simpler way than all this trig identity manipulation stuff, all right? Now, it may not seem all that easy at first, all right? But we're gonna, we're gonna play with this. And all of circuits two is based on this. Because in circuits two, what we say is, if I don't care about the transient response, and I use complex exponentials, I can get rid of differential equations and go back to simply just do an algebra problem, all right? That's basically what I did, was I just turned this into a simple algebra problem. All right, it's a, it's, a, it's a harder algebra problem because it's got complex numbers, all right? We're gonna, we're gonna explore this more. Today's day one, right? So we'll talk more about this next week, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll have time to digest it. And I know you guys are primarily thinking about a test at 7 p.m. tonight. So um, that's the big thing on your mind, all right? So we'll have more to say about this, all right? Um, but uh, that's all I've got for today. All right. Nate, that spider thing's gonna be on the uh
It'll be on the video. It's going to be good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. I, I swear. I always check to it'll see be if out I'm there, YouTube. It'll be out there on YouTube forever now. Everyone's going to, I'm going to be famous.